Do you ever have a season in FM where basically everything feels like it's going wrong? Welcome to that season. Oh, and we signed Jaden Sancho. Yeah, really. We're busy licking our wounds over on stream right now, spending what is still a massive transfer budget. So join us over there once you've caught up over here. Something, something, VODs linked in the description, second channel, etc. So we came into season 11 of Building a Nation with Sirens of Malta, keen to build off the back of the best season we've had in the save by a comfortable margin. We wanted to improve our own success and continue that while hoping that Hamrun and the others could continue their wonderful success at the lower levels. For this video, I've also taken on board some of the we've had on recent videos so we're going to be showing more of the actual sort of profiles and attribute progression of a lot of the mainstays in the team and try to keep you guys updated with that because i realize if you don't see the streams you're not seeing the player progression and the profiles as much in these videos so i really should be showing those more in addition we'll also be taking a little look at the multinational team even though that isn't the point of the save there's been some interesting goings on and i thought it'd be fun to take a little look at that as well and if there are any other things that you think you'd like to see in these videos relating to the save and you want me to show them then drop them in the comments and i'll do my best to sort of within reason at least attribute and bring those into future videos as well to give you the complete picture so despite last season being a record year of spending for us where i believe we spent about 18 million pounds this year in spite of everything else we actually blew through that spending over 23 million pounds on new acquisitions but before we get to talk about those there are a couple of outs that i think we should briefly discuss the first of those is heretier rubagiri or, or dr rwanda as we've been referring to him uh, the main reason for the sale uh to tp mazembe ironically the club we pay <laughs> We actually bought him from in the first place was that he wasn't getting a lot of game time here and he was kicking off about it but also he had quite a large wage he was on like eleven thousand pounds a week here and for a player that's not playing we couldn't really afford to keep him on the books so when they came in and put a bid we thought you know what we'll take a little hit from the original fee but we're still getting i think once it's all done and good around seven hundred thousand pounds and more importantly we shift eleven thousand pounds off the wage bill which is always nice the other out was a, a very strange one i have to be honest is frank basala uh, one of our center backs that was sort of slipping down the order to being more of a third choice in many positions and then just randomly in the January transfer window Juventus said yeah don't mind a bit of that and they actually paid us six hundred thousand pounds for Frank Pasala which we were more than happy to do considering he just wasn't getting any game time I guess I'm just a little bit confused as to why Juventus was super interested he this is as good as he's gonna get as far as I'm concerned and we have better players so a very strange piece of business but we were happy to make the deal first of whom is Dudu and yes that's his name we were on the lookout for some more central midfield strength because we felt that was the one area of our team that we were just lacking depth in we had loads of wing backs loads of center backs loads of strikers it was just those central midfield spots really that were sort of causing us problems when we lost a couple of players or needed to rotate the squad there just wasn't a huge amount of decent quality depth so we dumped 3.7 million pounds into Dudu mostly to play as that sort of advanced playmaker role with that great passing great vision good on both feet we love a versatile player that can play off both feet I just find it really works nicely in the way that we set up tactically now obviously because of the way our player values are his value is nothing of the sort but we figured for 6k a week it was worth the punt we had huge amount of money so welcome Dudu although I must admit he hasn't actually played as much as I would have thought this year as we did as the year wear on found more players that were actually kind of good in this role as well so we've actually signed a lot of cms this year we've almost too many you might say which is why we then spent uh, a record transfer fee on dinko christich of dinamo zagreb now it's seven and a half million pounds but it is structured so we're actually only paying we only paid 2.5 for the first year the rest is structured over a three-year deal and it's actually only 5.5 the rest is in sort of um, add-ons that he would only get for certain examples what i will say though is that we were able to loan him out to nashar lions in the second tier to have a player of this kind of quality who is considered by the game to be a good premier league player playing in the second tier we thought would be the dream but unfortunately they have somehow not played him as much as we thought and he is there for a second year but we will have to really keep an eye on that because we weren't really intended to loan him out at all but when that kind of opportunity comes along you don't say no to that and then on the opposite side of things is a player that i genuinely am really surprised by this is farouk belaid uh, an algerian international center midfielder we are sort of essentially replacing heretier with him as far as the wages go but for 300k from usm algier we just really liked some of his attributes and for that kind of price you can really not fail to make some money out of the deal but in truth he's actually been genuinely excellent for us this season 12 starts 16 sub appearances but also the eight goals and five assists that he's got he's been especially useful in the league matches giving us those depths so we can rotate the squad around but he just looks genuinely fabulous when we play him in league matches and generally just 
in general, I've said the word general a lot there, but he's actually a really fun player to play around with. Now, he's pulling down the pecking order a little bit due to the arrival of a couple more guys, but still, I really like him. And then there's Jaden Sancho. Um, so the, the way this came about is that Chad and I were just joking around about how, you know, we should have a look for some players that have been released from their club, but I figured no one would actually be of any note would actually want to join us at this stage. And then there was just a few players we'd actually heard of. And Jaden Sancho was one of them. He'd just been released on a free transfer after an unsuccessful spell at Leicester City. And we figured, really, on a one-year deal, it was worth the risk just to bring him in and see what could actually happen. Now, you'll note that he's barely played. He hasn't scored or assisted. He spent most of the season injured. Um, but you know what? It was fun just to say we had Jaden Sancho in uh, Malta for a season, really. He literally got injured 20 minutes into, the de into his debut and has not really recovered. As you can see, he's under another injury right now. <laughs> it's, just, it's not great, really, poor Jaden. Now a player that we really, really, really like. This is Luis Brandao. He was released by Porto, uh, I believe, in the summer. And as it... As is the case with a lot of these players, they have interest from Saudi clubs, which means that their wage demands are absolutely astronomical. I believe when we first approached him, he wanted £60,000 a week. We said, no, see you later, buddy. We'll come back around when you've actually had a chance to reconsider. And then later in that same window, in fact, it might have even been past the window because he was a free transfer, we were able to go in again because he still had no interest. And once his wage dropped below the 20k mark, we figured, you know what? He's a very, very well-rounded central midfield player that can kind of operate in both of the roles that we use in the midfield. Like, he's a very accomplished advanced playmaker because he can pass, he's got great Great vision again solid on both feet and has a little bit of height but the fact is as a mez other than his long shots he's actually very accomplished in both which made him a really useful option for us so once he did join he once he got his injuries problem sorted he's been a fabulous player for us so far this season seven assists is really really good he's just a nice compliment to the team and you'll see again that's like the third central midfielder that we've signed already and there's more to come <laughs> we just kept finding new people another central midfield signing here this is david oroela uh, an ecuadorian central midfielder who again with the fantastic passing good on both feet two million pounds uh from liga de quito maybe this one was a bit of an overpayment um but he has at least kept some of his value and he is a bit younger than some of the others on quite a large way we tried out a slightly different uh transfer strategy and scouting strategy on top of what we were already doing it's hard to show you because it's so i'll, I'll actually show you genuinely so essentially what we did was we added every single attribute into the attribute picker here and set it to 20 um because your scouting knowledge is kind of rubbish for the most part anyway players you don't have much knowledge of and then we basically went down on the matches on here for things that actually match that until we started seeing some players coming up and once we got to a reasonable point where there was maybe, I don't know, 25 to 50 players that obviously they aren't actually 20, but they're just within that range. We didn't just scouted them all. And you'd be surprised how many interesting players came up in that search that despite the fact they didn't have 20s in there, it just gave you a little bit of a heads up on it. So give it a go if you're stuck for some scouting and looking for younger players. We tried it and we did find some interesting prospects in it. And he was one of them. Now, two million pounds, still quite a lot, but we do like him. Then we have a very interesting one. This is Michael Byrne, or as chat have been referring to him, Michael Bum, because the R and the N sort of blur into each other from a distance. And yeah, memes ensued but nevertheless um melbourne city young player who was only 18 when he actually joined us and we thought we'd take a punt because he looks quite solid he does lack speed which is the one thing i will say but his defensive tent poles other than his heading which is still not bad for an fm24 player if i'm honest got good aggression good bravery uh good jumping reach good on both feet six foot three and he's still very young so we do kind of like the look of michael Byrne, and hopefully he can be a really solid player for us in the future now he struggled to get a loan however what i will tell you is that since the, the making of this video essentially and me progressing into the future to start the stream save he has actually found a loan at a team called melita so him being on loan there could be a really nice uh, boon bonus? Bonus! Oh yeah, and on the topic of signing strange players that you wouldn't expect to sign, we also signed Iash Mariba on loan. That, that isn't so much the weird part. We, we did it because it's Iash Mariba, and we weren't going to have to pay that much money. It's who he's on loan from. But we signed him on loan from Haroya in Guinea. Now, that, again, not entirely strange for a slightly older player that maybe didn't succeed in Europe, but it is Iash Mariba. It's the fact that he'd been at Haroya since he was 23 years old. He was released by RB Leipzig, having made four... This is like career resurrection all over again. Joined Guinea inside Haroya and has been there ever since. He was 23 when he just gave up and went, no, nope, going to Guinea. And very, very strange indeed. I love seeing weird transfer moves like that. Now, obviously, he has got part Guinean second nationality or whatever, but regardless, it was weird to see him move there so young. We brought him back and he didn't even play, but it's just strange. I just thought I'd highlight that for you. Next, we have Fiwe Nkosi Motuang, who is from Kaiser Chiefs for £400,000. Now, the reason we got him, basically, is as much as we have depth in those wingback spots, the left the left side was good. We had lots of depth on the left-hand side, but really, it was only Ndoy and Vida 
on the right that we had the depth for. And when Feeway came through, we thought, actually, he looks a little bit decent. He can cross, he can tackle to a certain extent, he can mark. The only problem with him really is his off the ball and positioning are not super fantastic. But what he does have is ridiculous acceleration. And what we noticed, particularly for wingbacks this year, is insane agility is absolutely crucial. So we really, really like the look of him as well. And he has played a couple of games, but he only joined us in January. So he hasn't had a chance to really do that just yet, especially as he went straight off to like the domestic AFCON thing, where it's only players based in Africa. But at the time he was. So as a result, we lost him for like another month after that. Does have his first cap for Republic of South Africa though. So I think a really solid player for £400,000 just gives us a little bit more depth. Two more for you right now. The first of those was Norberto Ray. Uh, now he originally was the five-star potential and that's what got us to drop the £3.1 million into him from Lanos. Now that's obviously been dropped down right since then, but it's hard to tell with FM. It kind of fluctuates like crazy. So we're really not sure. The main reason though is we signed him because of the temp poles. Decent dribbling, finishing on first touch are spectacular, great technique as well reasonably composed but that can come in time not the quickest but again it can come in time i liked the look of him 3.1 million is quite a lot but what i can again tell you is that he has found a loan going into the next season with i believe it's uh Bikikara, which is a really solid loan for him given that he's a two-star ca guy those are the kind of guys we really want out on loan and developing because they will develop with the clubs i want that next harris jivkovic type of player and i wonder if that player could be norberto ray and it turns out that a lot of players called norberto ray seem to be quite good in your saves and then you can select how long you want to sim for and then you just hit go on holiday and it will do it for you unreal if that helps there you go thank you very much for that advice smelly mint <laughs> just... <laughs> and lastly yeah it's another central midfielder but this one i feel like is the real deal uh this is gonzalo diaz 23 year old uruguayan international now admittedly he wasn't a uruguayan international when he joined us but as is often the case in fm you sign a player and they're like hmm better get a call up immediately and as a result his wage has gone up to 15k but regardless for free i mean a free transfer for a four-star ca four-star pa midfielder it's it's the dream he is phenomenally good um he's only started six games for us three goals three assists in that period now and obviously he signed in like march so he hasn't had much of a chance to bet in or play in europe for us but regardless he is absolutely brilliant and i think he could him and camgren lend in the midfield could make a massively wonderful pairing for us next year and give us a lot of depth elsewhere because a lot of the guys that are being thrown into the first team can now be the second choice players and are happy to do so because they're on relatively small contracts and that i think is going to give us massive midfield depth going into next year it makes me quite excited about it frankly but i think Gonzalo Diaz, easily one of the best signings we've made in the save, especially for free. I think he's going to be fabulous. And just before we move on uh, from transfers and stuff, I essentially fell into my own trap this year. And what I mean by that is we had a relatively troublesome chatter who basically was just spamming stuff about Arda Goulet. You know how it goes, but in a really aggressive and unnecessary way. So to sort of placate that and also be somewhat sassy, I changed the name of a random Turkish player from the lower leagues to also be Arda Goulet, so I could just keep looking that guy up instead of the actual Arda Goulet, who is at Benfica, in case you're wondering. Only for someone in chat to then ask for a look up for the actual Arda Goulet and for me to fall into my own trap. Curiously for a second. Um, I'm gonna look him up now because I am curious as how he's got on. Um <laughs> wait, hang on a minute. Wait, is that the guy I renamed? <laughs> I just fell into my own trap. That is the FM equivalent. <laughs> of putting a mouse trap down with cheese in it to catch a mouse, walking out of the kitchen, coming back in and going, ooh, piece of cheese, and then getting your finger blown off. Before we move on to League and Tactics stuff, uh, a little tidbit about the Lone Farm will be coming later because there have been some new developments just ever so slightly to do with that. So stay tuned because for all the things that have gone a little bit tits up this year, the Lone Farm has actually been flourishing to a level I have not had for a very long time. And on the Tactics side of things, we have reverted back to our normal style of play mostly this year because we found genuinely that just even having that tactic used, the, the memes one, for a while was really disrupting us. Even when we used it for a few games and then switched back, I think the tactical familiarity was just getting completely screwed up and it has really caused us this year along with some other things which you're about to see which we only won by four points uh, and our goal difference was only four better than hammerage this year it was a year uh, we were for the long i think for about the first 15 games we were not even top of the league we were really not struggling we were just struggling to get above them having lost to them earlier in the season and until the final day of the window as you'll see here from the scores we could have lost this title uh, if we hadn't have won at the letter on the final day and also hammer having dropped some points for the first time in what felt like months we could have potentially lost this title because of the goal difference situation there as well we went into the final day having level pegging on goal difference and only two points clear it could have gone very very wrong indeed so definitely the smallest winning margin we've had for a while and it does show you that 
obviously we've had our troubles this year, but how much better teams like Hamroon are getting. And that's really quite a crucial. It's also worth noting that the league has officially essentially split into two. There's now a top seven and a bottom seven. There's an 11 point gap between seventh and eighth in the league. And all of those teams were well into the race for European football. At one point, Sweetie were top. They won like their first eight matches, but then just kind of dropped off a little bit. And Goodyear looked nowhere, but then went on a great run towards the end of the season and were able to sneak in on the final day or on goal difference due to results elsewhere. So we do still get the usual suspects in Europe, I suppose. Birkikara this year were massively better due to Vladimir Stava on loan, who's banged 20, although that's just in the league. I think he's getting close to 30 in all comps, along with Armando Perez on loan at Hamron. He's our first two and a half star current ability player out on loan, and it really is showing. Down at the bottom, well, Tarshin actually were winless through their first 20 games of the season, then won three in a row to get themselves above Floriana, then lost the final three. So it actually makes it, they've still went down, but they went down with a little bit less um, ignominy. They didn't quite do a master and go a full season without a win. Scenes in the second tier, though, as Melita, semi-pro Melita, actually won the league, which is genuinely very, very interesting indeed over a lot of pro sides around them. The three teams directly below them are all pro, Marsa being one of them, of course, coming back up. Uh, Slima didn't manage to come back up this year, but I can tell you they have strengthened a lot in this summer with loans from us. And Nashar, despite taking four players from us on loan, all of whom were good enough to be like top six, top four type of club players in the top flight, somehow balls it up to a ridiculous level, including Dinko and Christie but they had three others as well. And that brings us to where things start to take a little bit of a turn. And that is us in Europe. But this time, I managed to make an early version of the save file. So we do actually have the proper data. Look at me go. Professional content creator and all that. So we actually started off playing the house that memes built in some of the Champions League qualifiers. Got a 2-0 victory at St. Iskaniksic. Relatively straightforward. We then followed that up with a 4-1 win in the second leg. But you can see that it wasn't really doing a great deal for us as far as statistics go. We were quite lucky to win this. This then set up a tie against Shamrock Rovers, where once again, we did get the win. But it was really starting to struggle. And I was thinking, actually, is this the right idea? And truthfully, it genuinely wasn't. We should not have been playing this tactic in Europe because it really upset our tactical familiarity. And it meant that it took us a while when we went back to our normal tactic to even really get any cohesion going again. But we did win. And in the second leg, actually reverted back to our normal style of play and still only won 2-0. But we're looking a little bit more comfortable and through to the playoff round where we would face Maccabi Tel Aviv of Israel. And a 3-3 draw in Israel was not quite what we were expecting. Uh, really, we went behind through that penalty, uh, then managed to get ourselves in a good position, but just could not seem to stop conceding silly goals and ended up with a 3 all draw. And I was a bit worried at this point. Luckily, we needn't have been as we finally put down a great performance with a 6-0 hammering in the home leg. Palacio with a brace as well from left wing back, which is amazing. Fafana scored a couple of goals. The usual players getting involved in this as well, which is just nice to see. It was felt like a bit of normality was resuming for the time being. That, of course, did put us into the Champions League big group, as we like to call it. And then we got an insanely tough set of draws. Like we were getting teams that really Portuguese and French sides and stuff in pot four, where it's never an easy draw. It just never is. And that kind of showed as we went away to Atletico and lost by three goals to one. We did get the equaliser for Camgo and Len, but they just had a little bit of quality right at the death there with Baldanzi and then another goal from Javi, uh, Xavi Gimons. Thankfully, we were able to play slightly better against Sporting despite going behind. They were one of the pot four draws that we got this time. Melman and two late goals from Henry Watara were able to give us the victory. And we thought, OK, get back to winning ways. Get it going from now. We've got PSV up next. That's a more, ironically a pot three team, but slightly more winnable for us. And it showed. 4-0 win. Melman with a hat-trick. Vidasini with a goal. You'll note that he's got an X in his name now. We've just Maltese style. Maltatized him because he has now declared for the Maltese national team. Hence why we're going to be talking about the Maltese national team later on. But we got a 4-0 victory. But again, it wasn't the most emphatic statistical performance from us. I think 4-0 was very unfortunate in a way for PSV Eindhoven. Easily could have just been like a straightforward 2-0 win. But it was nice to get it. And Vida was amazing yet again. And then we faced Dortmund and actually pulled off an unbelievable result where we took the lead went behind through two very annoying goals, but then Watara and a Palacio goal in the 95th minute bailed us out for another man of the match performance. He has carried us at times this year, but again, statistically, we weren't really that good and it just felt like something wasn't quite right with us. But we actually managed to pick up nine points from our first four games and feeling pretty confident. And then AFCON hit. So as some of you know, AFCON occurs in November. And it means that you lose, if you've got a lot of players from African nations that are actually kind of good, a lot of your team. Uh, and we lost 14 players to AFCON. Now, not all of them obviously were starters for us, but at least half of our starting 11 and subs also went off to AFCON, which left us decimated, particularly to add injury to injury. Half of the players that were then back decided to then get injured, leaving us with an absolute skeleton crew crew going into our final matches before Christmas, uh, which was supposed to be the easy ones against Marseille and Young Boys, which could have, with two wins, put us on 15 points, be absolutely cruising. But it's tough to do that when you don't have any players. As then this happened, uh, we went to Marseille and lost 3-0. They were 35th and had barely scored a goal uh, prior to this match, and we just gave them everything. And Doi got injured in this game. Uh, we ended up playing youngster Seidu Kwasi Aua up top with Melman, who could do nothing. Uh, Vega in the team, Dudu started. There was The defense was relatively unchanged. It was just 
every single attacking option for the most part was either missing i mean look at our bench here we've got a lot of like youth players the actual like multis youth players on the bench because there was no one else we were bringing them on in the game because we had so little depth anymore because i believe we were missing at one point 18 of our 18 players from our squad were missing at one point it was insane but the problem was because of the reputation of us at the moment we can only really sign those types of players from nations in africa because of the reputation being slightly lower we are growing to the point now where we can start getting players from eastern europe and scandinavia and south america but at the moment a lot of our squad is african and as a result we lose we get heavily screwed a little bit by afcon that will change over time thankfully it's not on next year so we should be okay but at least tony sunday won afcon with nigeria so i suppose there's that and it then got worse as we put in an absolutely shocking performance despite actually scoring two goals in this game we didn't deserve anything and young boys comfortably beat us by three goals to two and yeah i mean quasi what i will say is this has resulted in the emergence of seidu quasi awua who has been unbelievable for us this season and jose padilla as well two of our younger players have been forced into the starting lineups because despite melman sticking around he has been able to do absolutely nothing we just lost all of our attacking threat pretty much because of afcon it's just one of those things and as a result we could just offer nothing going forward so those two wins those two games that should have been wins for us were not and we were just looking a bit naff we then got our squad back and it didn't really make any difference. You can see that we were able to at least field a relatively full strength side here against Valencia and then lost 2-1 at home to them as well. Um, frustrating one. The penalty was one of those just nonsense penalties that just happen sometimes. It is what it is. It was a, a just a bloody frustrating Champions League campaign in general. We'd also been messing about with tactics in January, which I think again messed up the team cohesion. And that's why I'm just going to commit to our current style like we've been doing because it's been working so well for us. Maybe dick about with funny tactics after we're knocked out of Europe. That way it doesn't affect our cohesion into the next season. But for the time being, we really need to get our heads down and focus because we were in trouble we suddenly had we went from having nine points from four games to nine points from seven games and genuinely worrying as to whether we'd even qualify for the knockouts thankfully we then just got a bit of a bright spark as we went to psg and got a draw uh, mostly thanks to the goalkeeping of richard Gakune, because we again offered nothing going forward but it is psg so that's what you'd kind of expect from us away from home but we, we were very fortunate to get this draw luckily 10 points is usually enough to get you through and it did but not in the way that we used to. As you'll see, we came 21st. Having come 8th last season, we went down to 21st with only 10 points. Uh, didn't really score a lot. Lost a lot of games that we shouldn't have. And maybe even won a couple of games that we shouldn't have. It was a very, very poor season from us on many respects. But it did at least qualify us for the knockouts, where we would face Arsenal. It didn't get easier, as we were rubbish at home. Usually we're better against these sort of sides at home, but Karim Kanate, we just gave him the ball and he slotted it home. But Kairo Saka scored a penalty. We also got a red card for sake of Fafana for two footing someone from behind because reasons. And it was just pretty much all over after the first leg. We did put up a better fight at the Emirates, but Karim Kanate is just that good. But Kairo Saka again. Watara did get us a goal. And I think 3-1's maybe a tiny bit harsh, but really not. 3-2 maybe. Needless to say, 5-1 exit on aggregate and just a genuinely poor season from us in Europe. We must do better next year. And I think with the players we've signed... Now that we can bed these guys in, stick to the tactics and kind of go for it, I actually think we're going to be on for a massive season next year, but this was a write-off for us. So all round, very poor from us in many ways. However, we did still have Maltese friends that could hopefully help us out, and we were going to be relying on them this year quite a lot. And first up, we're Becky Kara, who got off to a fantastic start, easily breezing past Latvia inside Daugav Pils to set up a tie in the next round with Cluj of Romania. Not a super tough tie but also not a super easy one either and then unfortunately this happened a fantastic 3-1 victory set them up perfectly and then they lost 3-0 in romania and we were just like head in hands moment you can't be throwing away results like that lads but they were in theory at this time at least the slightly weaker of the teams that we had in europe because next up was goodyear united who all in all are a much better side and it really showed and when we saw that they'd drawn a swiss side in the first round we were worried sorry second round but then they beat st gallen and i'm thinking yes okay this is starting to look more like a team that i start to expect to do things for us sets up a time the next round against viking which they were even better in with a fantastic result in norway to progress to the playoff round for the first time in the club's history and they were this close to getting all the way through they faced Sparta Prague. They got a 2 all draw in the Czech Republic and I thought perfect and then they managed to balls it up at home. Lost 3-1 and it just wasn't their day but they did at least reach the playoff round they've shown a real level of fight now it's just those last little things like they clearly can beat these teams they just need to be a little bit more consistent i think they had a couple of injuries too which didn't help we continue to strengthen them and i think they, it's only a matter of time before they get into that group stage and then can really start to push on but unfortunately that just left hammering yet again and to be fair to them they hit the ground running comfortably breezing through the first two rounds of qualification in the europa league against mlados and sepsi of romania to set up a third round tie against hammerby of sweden and this is where things start to take 
take a turn because unfortunately they lost 4-0 in Sweden and it really just completely ended the tie there. Despite managing to win the home leg, it wasn't enough, but they were of course dropping down into the playoff round of the Conference League where they were handed probably one of the toughest ties imaginable against Ron of France. And uh, well, actually, as you'll see here, they did manage to win the home game against them, which shows the quality that they truly have and it was a deserved win as well, but they couldn't carry it through the second leg in France. And I think that was more a case of the draw was just too unbelievably tough for them to push through. I think pretty much anyone except like a French, English, Spanish or German side there and they're completely getting through. But that's just how it goes sometimes, unfortunately, which meant that they were all out before we'd even have a chance to get any points for them. And that is a real problem. But despite all of that, and that is kind of bad, as you'll see here, we only managed to get 8.25 points, which was actually sort of worse than the season we'd had two years ago and a full five points worse than last year. It shows you what happens, though, if you don't get that second team in there and you also fail to really make any ground yourself up. But most of that, I think, comes from not having hammering in the group stages and such. It was still a solid year. It's still better than the 4.5, so it was still gains. And more importantly, those gains do push us for next year anyway, all the way up to 16th place. So the growth is still happening. It's just maybe not as fast this season as we would have had. So is it a complete disaster? No, but it felt like it was there to be won. Um, I felt with Hammer being 2 0 up against Rom, I was hoping that they would just get themselves through. And with Goodyear being 2 or was it 2 all draw at home, I figured surely they can beat them, sorry, in the away game rather. But it just didn't happen. It was just not quite there. But what I would say is I'd rather come 16th this year than 15th because 15th is when you get an extra team in Europe and that's a good thing. But I'd much rather have one more year of being 16th place because it means the points dilution is a little bit less. And if we were to get a bang in year, there's a chance we could go and grab like 15 points if we were to get two teams in the group stage next year before we have to worry about getting that fifth team into Europe, which is definitely coming. But at least we've put it off for another season. And I feel like next year we'll easily manage to do it and jump right up into that group. Because if you actually look, we are very close to a lot of these teams teams around us. Although what I will say is Belgium are losing an absolutely shocking year coming up. We should still, though, be able to make really nice ground up on everyone except Belgium. And that makes me really happy. And we might even start to catch a team like Ukraine, who actually had, as you'll see here, the fourth best year of any team in Europe. 17.5 points for Ukraine is wild. And my point is, that's what we hope to be able to do because of the points dilution being slightly less. And that's the key. They were 16th this year, and that's what they were able to do with their teams actually pulling in the same direction. So not amazing. But now it's time to talk about the youth intake which was also not amazing. However, I do want to show you something from it because it's a little bit quirky. This year's youth intake, um, we did sign up three players for it, but the main reason we signed up one of these chaps here, well, you can see why, it's uh, Simone Chiavetta. For some reason, and I don't really understand why, we got a guy from San Marino in our youth intake. Not only that, um, now he hasn't got caps for San Marino yet, but I can tell you now that by the time that you see this on stream, he has actually got a cap for San Marino. He got a cap at 16 years old, which is just, I mean, obviously it makes sense, it's San Marino. It's just a little bit strange that we got him in the youth intake at all born in San Marino, doesn't have any connection to Malta from what we can see, but there he is. So I guess I just wanted to show you that. Turning our attention now to the stats, and I mean, look at this, right? The top goal scorer this year was Padilla and Melman with 15, Awua and Henry Watara with 14. We've had players go like 35 goals. It, it's just dead. We just could not seem to score goals, and I feel like the tactical familiarity really did cost us. The assists were still actually okay this year. Um, Vida with 13, not as many as he did get. Melman still managed 13 as well, and you can really see that Jose Padilla is starting to get into the conversation to be potentially starting in place of Melman. There is a lot of areas, though, where Padilla is just objectively worse, but a year, year and a half more, and I think he's going to be the starter for us, which is exciting too. And the same can actually apply to potentially someone along the lines of Seido Kwasi Awur, who's got 14 goals this year, overperformed his XG massively, looks like the type of guy that could really develop. You can see here that he's now three and a half stars in our team, which is really, really nice. And it's also worth noting that Seiko Fafana, six goals this year. Six. That's correct. He got over 30 last year and he managed six. Now, you can also see that the minutes that these guys were getting because of all the injuries and AFCON and various things was just so badly diminished. I think he played less than half the number of minutes this season that he did last year. Even so, six is still very low. And just looking at how we generally set up this year, this is mostly how on a good day we tend to set the team up with Fafana and Melman, ideally, Camgo and Len, Sunday, and of course, Gonzalo Diaz, Palacio, Vitezinho, Tunkara, Rojas, and Rangelovic with Kikuna in goal. But now let's actually have a look through some of the development of these players. Starting, I suppose, with Fafana, and you can see he's looking very, very good. Like, he's developed into an excellent player for us. Ignore the fact that the, va the values are just shocking, right? Is he, they go up during the window and then drop down the mid the window shuts, basically. He's got those caps, but if you actually look at the way he's developed, which I think is more interesting, and that's why I want to sort of highlight with this, you can see, especially his finishing. Now, we did have him on finishing training or shooting for a little while, hence why his long shots have also got by five. God damn. Those RDF training schedules, mate. What on earth? That's a brilliant result. To go up by five finishing there is fantastic. And we've really been working on that with our sort of winger come striker players because they do need to develop that. But also, composure's gone up really nicely. 
He's just looking really nice on the development. Melman again, like the stars sort of lie to you a little bit here. He's still an excellent striker for us as that player, particularly with the six foot five-ness. Melman's development, again, is absolutely shocking. Obviously, I realize my face cam is possibly covering some of the physical ones here, but he hasn't really improved much there anyway. Where his improvements have really come is things like his composure and his anticipation up six, up five decisions. Now, we have been training attacking movement final third on him pretty much since the day he joined us, and that's the reason he's got those huge gains, because that's what that really focuses on. The rest of this is mostly just going to come from him playing football, pretty much. Palacio, arguably pound for pound, I would say, the best player at the club as far as pure attributes go. He could literally do a job as a winger with the quality he has. I'm very curious to see what his development looks like. Good God. <laughs> God. What's that? Wait, what, what attribute is that? positioning ah yes that's why so basically i add him back to defensive positioning training for a little bit and you can see why his marking and his position it's gone up by seven that's incredible i love seeing development charts like this and genuinely if you are interested i'm using the rdf training schedules and they are superb um you just they're just so explosive if you get them on the right players at the right time with the right set of additional focuses and that's what we've been using on him additional focuses to improve the weaknesses i didn't realize his positioning had gone up by so much tony sunday as well very fabulous player i suspect we'll see a similar improvement on him as well because despite that he never gets good ratings in matches because he's a halfback but i still really like him and he's now one afcon too i expect we're going to see similar stuff on tony right Okay, not quite as drastic with Tony, though his vision's gone up by six, which is kind of surprising. He's been mostly on things like defensive positioning as well, but his positioning's already 19, so he hasn't had as much room to grow on that one, but his marking's gone up by a massive amount. His composure's up by eight. Then we have Vida Zinia, of course, with his three multi caps now. I suspect we're going to see less growth on Vida because Vida was kind of good when he signed for us, and it seemed like he might have been towards max CA, so he's had mostly just a few little improvements here and there, and actually a couple of decreases here on some of his physicals, which is kind of intriguing, but his marking has still improved. Tunkara. I swear he had 17 tackling at one point. We also had a 20 million pound bid for him from LA Galaxy in January. Obviously, I didn't want to get rid. I love that his value is now back to 1 million pounds. But you can see with him, I think he might have been fairly close to his max CA as well, because he has really not taken to a lot of the things we've been trying in training. Still some improvements in his positioning and stuff, but not the same kind of growth we've seen with some of the other younger players that we've had a chance to develop ourselves. And I suspect with someone like David Rojas, it's going to be a similar story. Now, he has also been here less time. I think only a full season, so little to no progress with him at the moment. And I suspect it'll be the same with Rangelovic, who has been a proper bellend this year, constantly complaining about wanting to leave. At one point, he kicked up a fuss because I turned down a 500k bid from FK Partizan, the club he moved to us from when he was a starter here, and we paid £4 million. He was like, no, no, half a million pounds to go back to the club I came from, even though you're literally starting me every game. That seems totally reasonable. How dare you not let me move? And we have seen some improvements with him. Actually, his heading's gone up by two, which is genuinely surprising. And lastly, we've got Richard Guicuno, who I think we will see some really solid development on him. 22 caps for Senegal now. Yeah, just some nice development across the board. Not as much as I would actually think. Vision's improved a little bit. Just some good stuff in there. He's slowly getting there. While we're at it, I do want to quickly highlight Jose Padilla and show you how much he is developing into the player. Now, he was already very good. Unfortunately, he's no longer a model citizen because... Yeah, it's just how it works, unfortunately. Um, just being at the club was enough to knock him off a of model citizenship. But his progress should be pretty nice. Yeah, it's reasonable. Like, he's not been here that long yet, but he's definitely getting better in certain areas. And it's just nice to see him slowly developing. One more while we're at it. So you can see the sort of development of uh, Seiru Kwasi Awu. And the original plan with him was just to be a lone farm winger. But then when he started getting some game time for us in the first team and playing well, I've decided that, no, no, you're going to be a striker and you're going to work for us. And he has, frankly. That, that CA development this season is crazy. Now, a lot of that's probably form-based, but still. Don't, we're, don't know whether we're going to see too much on this one just yet, as he's not really been here long enough. Though his anticipation is up by three ever since we moved him over to attacking movement, which is really nice, just to keep building him into the striker that he can be. He feels like the next Fafana type of player, personally. Hopefully Fafana has a better season next year. So there we go. Hopefully that was a little more of an insight into some of the players that we've got in the first team and how they developed. I won't always show the full attribute progression, but I do want to show more of the actual player profiles so you guys get a more idea of what the team is actually like. Now, a quick sojourn over to the Maltese national squad, who are currently ranked 100. 162nd in the world, or 161st as it is. But uh, let me just move my camera over to the left-hand side so you can see. They have been relatively stagnant for quite some time. Had a little jump, then stalled out here. Um, but since the arrival of Brian Spiteri as the manager, they have started to see some improvements, which is around about here when he joined. I think it was around about here, actually, when he joined the club. The club? The club of the nation. But it's over this period here where there's been real growth, and that's because they've actually started doing stuff in matches. Got up to 160th, which is all oh, the, the dizzying heights. But when you look at the national team squad, look at the sheer number of players that have um, naturalized to become multi-citizens and how many of them play for us it's a relatively good amount you'll see most of them are other guys that have the grade out here however what i will say is almost all of the others have also played for us at one point or another but most of them still 
actually play in Malta. In fact, I believe they all do, other than Jefferson at Adelaide United. Everyone else is still playing domestically. Loads of different nationalities have switched over and more will continue to do so. But what has this actually meant for Malta on uh, a level? How have they gained that rank? Well, I'll show you. Their World Cup qualifying campaign has been superb. In 2033, they drew at home to Hungary, which is wild. Lost to Denmark, as you'd expect. Drew away at Serbia with Roel Platt and John Guerrero scoring the goals. Got a win against Georgia with Edemar scoring. Then got hammered by Denmark. Still scored a couple of goals. Another draw against Hungary with goals from Joao and Christopher Dimek, who is a striker that we brought through our youth intake, who is utterly dreadful. But he's actually got a few temples. That means he gets national team call-ups. And then a draw away at Georgia with John Guerrero again. They could have won that game too. And what that has meant is that they've actually come third in their World Cup qualifying group with seven points. They finished above Hungary and Georgia in their World Cup qualifying group, which is really good for the way the pots work with this and might actually give them a chance at progression into the future. Just really exciting developments considering that they've done nothing in World Cup qualifying up to this part. They are steadily starting to improve and even though the national team is irrelevant to this save, I just thought it was exciting and wanted to show you. Right, loan farm. Bam. Negative 113 players out on loan. You love to see it. I should stress, for those of you that have maybe haven't watched one of my series like this before, um, the reason it says negative 113 is because if you go past 128 players that are out on loan, it sort of integer overflows and comes back the other way on a negative. So what this actually means, if I remember this correctly, is that we currently have 143 players out on loan. And it dropped down to 90 at the start of the year because of players coming back. And I said we wanted to focus on quality over quantity. This year, it's just been both. Uh, for some reason, since the latest winter update, I've noticed huge amounts of increasing interest in loan players. It's been fabulous. We actually, on deadline day in the summer, got 21 players out on loan just on deadline day. It's absolutely wild. And there's a few more players that definitely could do with a loan and hopefully they'll get a chance to get those loans in the summer but this is the step in the right direction we've been looking for because what you'll see now when you look at the potential we've got a lot more three and a half four star five star four and a half star guys out on loan and that's what we're really really looking for getting those guys out on loan letting them develop building into the clubs that we know they can be i mean staver there you can see 24 goals for bikikara this year perez with 25 pablo de jesus with 28. He's only a, a one-star player, but regardless, he does bits for them as well. There's a lot of good options out on loan, absolutely banging goals in left, right, and center, and it's absolutely brilliant. Now, I said there was a couple more tidbits, and there are. We have a couple more theories about the way that the loans work, and I always want to share this with you as we come along. So, editor and general brilliant person, Hadrian, has done some sort of tests with some data. Uh, so I sent him my save file, and he just basically had a look through at some of the numbers on things. And what we were kind of noticing, or what he noticed rather, is that the loan players seemed to fit a certain category whenever they were loaned out. And there was three things that they slipped into. One, it felt like every new loan that we put out always seemed to fall somewhere outside of the top six, top five or six players at the club they were being loaned to as far as their CA goes. So when you look at the team report, they'd always be like fifth best or sixth best or lower in that as far as the loans. They would never seem to take players on loan that would be the best player at the club or even in the top five, for whatever reason. The other thing, though, is that they always were the joint best or the best player in their individual position at the club. That was true. They also had some of the best PA at the club, though that would always make sense because they are fairly young. And the final thing was they, they always seemed to move into a position where there was an older real-life player at the club currently. Now, I suspect that the real-life part isn't actually the key. It's more likely that there's an older player in that role. It's just that it so happens that as, as things are currently, most of the older players are real-life players because that's how we are. And I suspect that later into the save, that will just be older players. So it seems like if you really want to be targeting loans at certain club, aim for the guys that are going to be sort of between 6th and 20th in terms of CA. Just looking at stars, obviously, not pure numbers. We don't know those, but that's just how the game tells us. They either want to be the best or tied best for CA in the position you're loading them in. And if there is an older player in that position already, they seem more likely to want to take the player. We don't know why. That just seems to be the findings so far. So do with that what you will. Use it. Don't use it. I don't know how you really can use it, but just think about it as far as that's what might happen as far as interest for your loans, particularly if you're trying part exchange. Finances this year, relatively straightforward. Like we're not really selling players for huge money because we can't, um, but nevertheless, the money's been relatively straightforward. 43 million pounds in the bank. We'll get a little bit more for trans like Champions League TV money, which comes in a little bit later, I believe. It's only going to be a million here or a million there. But generally speaking, we're earning good money each year and our wage budget isn't getting out of control, although it has got a lot bigger. So that might have to start being a thing. But hopefully as we develop, it shouldn't matter too much. We'll start earning more money from players sales if we can get some decent value for them at the end of windows and things like that so it shouldn't be too much of an issue money is still very very nice you can see we have an enormous transfer budget not that we can spend all of it but i reckon we'll spend yet another probably 20 million pounds this year of just bringing in more guys for the loan farm because especially this summer i've noticed that we've got less guys that are just primed and ready for loans we've actually got so many of them out we kind of need to restock with more loan players as for the aims for season 12 well it's very simple we need to get back on the horse and start winning matches again in europe actually starting to look good and starting to pull away domestically again a little bit and 
and try to get like top eight again. Maybe not, but like at least look better in the league as far as the, the big group stage. And hopefully the other Maltese sides, we we'll just need one of them in the group stage. Another one of them in the group stage this year, most likely hammering. But if good, you fancy joining them too. If we got both of them in it, it would be Ukraine levels potentially if they could do the business. Because I feel like once they get there, they get the points. It's just getting through those qualifiers that are the key. So that is what we're going to be doing over on stream right about now. So if you have enjoyed this video, drop a like. That would be fabulous. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. Join us over there. And I've got some other videos coming out very soon. I was ill last week, which is why we're a little bit behind on that sort of stuff. But that means I've just got a backlog of stuff to release like the end of a hose. So I'll see you guys soon. Hold your gun. Capybara. Bye-bye.